And actually, since this conference today is meaningful and so memorable, we are actually providing live webcasts in the internet, and uh, so that all the people around the globe can also join us and participate in our conference. So up next, we have invited Mr. Jason Fessler, senior. Principal Architect in Yahoo Operations, he provides the technical leadership across all layers of the company, driving towards Yahoo's plan of offering services via IPv6. Jason, please. Hello, I'm Jason from Yahoo. Here to talk about World IPv6 Day. Uh, just a brief agenda. Um, first, want to cover a little bit of the. Motivations and concerns we've got for IPv6 from a content provider's view. Um, you'll hear a lot of similarities from Eric's presentation, and then I'll talk about World IPv6 Day, what we did to prepare for it, the lessons we learned from it. So the motivations: um, IPv4 is running out, but CGN or NAT does work, right? Mostly. If IPv4 addresses were motorcycles. This is 15 years ago. You can go on-road, off-road, do a lot of exploration, a lot of applications you can do with this. But the internet has become extremely su uh, successful, very popular, and it's to the point now to where there are a few places to actually park your bike. NAT is the current alternative. Many residences one shared address. Uh, we have heard stories ranging from the tens to the hundreds to even a thousand plus residences sharing one NAT address. And that gives us a little bit of pause. Uh, geolocation definitely becomes a lot less precise. The abuse angle of this, people attacking our site, our ability to defend ourselves is also a concern. And lastly, there are a lot of performance considerations around following everybody through a single device to do this address sharing. Uh, briefly, IPv4 today, um, in the United States at least, people from different residences, different cities, they'll come to Yahoo, they'll come directly to Yahoo without sharing an address. With that, we can tell where they're at. We can tell not what region they're in, but actually what city they're in, and in a lot of cases, even what part of the city. We use that for several of our products. We use it on our homepage to show local news. We use it on our search results to show locally relevant search results and advertisements. We use it for contractual obligations with some of the stream media, sports events, for example. We're not able to show a sports event due to contractual limitations unless we know the users in another region. The television market has the monopoly for the local area. With NAT, those people are being served from one IP, and those people may be from different cities. And with that, we'll no longer have that knowledge of where they're from. In our best case scenario, this is one particular ISP I've talked to, uh, they will aggregate down to at least a regional basis. We'll be able to tell which metropolitan area they're from. But if the user is somewhere in the middle, they'll be kind of assigned either to that large area or that large area. And as such, targeting will definitely be impacted. Another ISP we've talked to, very different story. Uh, we'll be able to tell what country they're in, but that is it. This is only good enough to meet legal obligations with respect to what we're allowed to um, give file-wise. Abuse is the other hot topic on this today. If a machine is compromised within somebody's home, and it starts to send malicious traffic to Yahoo, we may have no other choice but to actually block that host by its IP address. And in the event of address sharing with NAT, we're instead not going to block the one computer, but everybody behind that one address. We're going to block a thousand plus users. And this is if it's just one machine. 
imagine a thousand machines spread out throughout the world that are compromised with the same malicious software and us blocking all of them. That's a million users off from our services. Um, it scares us. Very heavy collateral damage from that. So we know that the IPv4 well is dry. We know that NAT is going to happen. And it happens heavily already here today in Hong Kong. And it's going to happen much more in all countries around the world. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We have to come to grips with that. We have to try and mitigate for that through any means we have. Part of that is through the promotion of IPv6. If we can have users on IPv6 that bypasses the NAT, bypasses the shared address, bypasses the collateral damage issues. Which leads us to our participation in World IPv6 Day. Um, I think everybody here knows about IPv6 Day already. Um, very briefly, it did give the world an opportunity to do a real test drive of the IPv6 internet on a wide basis that could not be done in a lab. This was the real world test with all players involved, random people involved, stuff you can't simulate. Most of our markets participated with the Yahoo front page. We did have to exclude a few key markets because they were either separate companies or they were running an older technology stack that we weren't able to put in uh, in time. Um, notably, uh, Yahoo China, Yahoo Japan are not represented in World IPv6 Day, but most other markets were. So any statistics throughout this talk, keep that in mind, please. We were not ready to actually deploy IPv6 through all of those data centers. There was a uh, little bit of an effort involved to make that happen. We're still not quite ready due to vendor delays and some issues that have come up. We were able to deploy IPv6 within several of our backbone pops. We uh, put in proxy servers in each of those locations running um, the Apache traffic server. And we implemented six to four outbound relays in each of those locations for customers that came to us through six to four to help improve their chances of success. On that day, our HTML content specifically was dual stack. We did not include images or CSS. The next event that we hold, we will do that. Uh, this was just a very uh, simple participation for the event. And this was mostly to make sure that nothing would break on our part and to help uh, reach out to end users who we knew would be impacted, but do that in a meaningful way to where they would notice problems, no matter whether they went to us or to Google or Facebook or wherever. We knew there was some risk involved. We knew that there would be breakage, the broken user problem. We know that a number of users have IPv6 enabled, quite a few. We knew that uh, a number of them actually have IPv6 addresses a smaller number of them. When they go to try and use those addresses, they failed. That could be due to broken 6 to 4 relays. It could be due to local firewalls on the host or a myriad of other reasons. It's a very long list, actually. Um, our particular measurements um, just before and after IPv6 day were that uh, 22 out of every 100,000 users would be impacted by this. This stadium has 100,000 users in it. That circle represents the number of broken. Not too many at this small scale, but when you bring it up into the 100 million plus range, it's a lot of users. Those users would see timeouts. Go to the website, the web page would hang, depending on the OS, as long as 75 seconds. If they're on an iPhone, it would never actually fail over to IPv4. Effectively, to our customers, we would be down. Because of this, we would not actually want to be the only site going dual stack at once. Because then our 
those broken users would simply go to our competition. A big part of World IPv6 Day was that we did this all together and shared that risk, shared that pain. We had a fair bit of customer outreach. We did have a real-time test on our front page, try and identify the broken users, try and tell them about, hey, things are going to be bad. Click the page, go to the help site, get more information, test their computer, etc. We did a lot of uh, traditional PR as well, as well as the, um, the social channels. Help page was translated to 38 different languages and was linked to in all of our press, all of our blog announcements, etc., so that people can test ahead of time instead of waiting for the uh, front page test to run. This is kind of what we feared would happen on IPv6 day. People were kind of watching the event, hoping for a big crash. We didn't know if a router might fail. We didn't know if our estimates of the broken users was wildly off. A lot of trepidation. In reality, it was just another day. This was just like Y2K, where everybody did a lot of preparation, a lot of work to make it go smooth. And during the event itself, nothing happened. We did have a few support calls, roughly 10. Many of the ISPs we talked to, similar story. If they had any at all, it was in the one to two digit range. This means that either our estimates of broken users is wrong, which I don't quite believe, or it means that people just figured the internet's broken today, I'll try tomorrow. This reinforces our desire that the next event we have, that it's not just for a day, it's for a longer period, or even just going dual stack for good. It might cause a little bit of pain, but it will ultimately get people to fix their local computer. We did uh, some trial runs. We did not want to actually shoot ourselves in the foot when everybody was watching. The idea is to, before the event, go dual stack for a small number of minutes in a network maintenance window. And if anything goes wrong, the network was down. It was NetOff's fault. They don't like me saying that. So the first event we tried was 15 minutes during a low period of our load. And we actually did find a problem. One of our sites, India in particular, their traffic shifted to the United States. We saw that and looked a little bit into it, and it turned out that our DNS system that monitors to see which sites are up through IPv4 and IPv6 was missing its IPv6 uh, configuration. It saw the colo was down and shifted traffic. It did what it was supposed to. We failed to set up the IPv6 portion of it. And so for that 15 minute window, all traffic for India was being served from the US with a little bit of latency, but stayed up. It was definitely valuable for us to see that. Had we had this happen on June 8th, it might've been a little bit more noticeable. We learned that monitoring is not the same in a dual stack environment. Just because the DNS servers can monitor and do a health check for IPv4 during this window doesn't mean that the IPv6 stuff was working. We did a second test run, this time at the peak of our traffic, do a much heavier smoke test to see what could break. We threw the switch 2 p.m. Pacific time, turned out to be 5 p.m. Eastern U.S. time, which just happens to be when people leave the office. We saw this 5% drop in traffic just as we threw the switch. Uh-oh. A little bit of a panic. Turned out it was normal. Nothing wrong. But it was a little bit of a surprise. This brought us to our next lesson. Don't make major changes at the same time that you see traffic shifts happen in your normal pattern. We will no longer make major changes like this at exactly o'clock. No longer five o'clock for any time zone. So June 8th rolls around. World IPv6 day is happening. Everything is great. Um, 
actually turned out to be pretty mellow night. Everybody on deck watching, but nothing going on. Um, except this little weird thing in the UK. Our colos in the UK showed that they there was no shift in traffic at 5 p.m. Pacific here. But our, the external monitoring from RIPE showed a big change in latency. It turned out that, again, our DNS servers that do their health checks had a malfunction. In this case, again, IPv6 was missing. We thought we learned from this the first time. Well, we did. But just a few days before this event, this particular DNS server serving the UK region was re-imaged. And they forgot to put IPv6 back onto it. Once this was noticed, it only took a few minutes to get it resolved. Traffic came back to normal times, being served back from the proxies in the UK, and life was good. As you can see, our actual ping times are better with IPv6 than with IPv4. It's just blind luck from where RIPE was measuring. So again, always have more than one way to look at things. The last key point on this is practice makes perfect. Before any major launch, do a test run. Do it in a maintenance window. Do it when there is less risk and audit things afterwards. So a few stats. The, this graph represents page views, number of, of page showings. We range between the 0.1 to the 0.17 range in just in terms of uh, page views. In terms of users, it was a little bit of a higher percentage, but I don't have that particular data here. Um, not a whole lot of traffic. There was actually more than this, but the rest of it was monitoring. It turned out monitoring traffic was the majority of our IPv6 traffic. But this is what represents real users. If we look at the region breakdown for this, Europe was the biggest portion. Keeping in mind that this excluded Yahoo Japan from the results as well as Yahoo China. Otherwise, this graph could look very different. Next is the Asian region. Last is the US region. If we break this down by unique users, the bulk of our users were from France, United States, Great Britain, and little bits from everywhere else. So that's not a whole lot of traffic. It's roughly a little over a couple million unique users that we have for this. The question is, did we actually move the needle? Did things actually change? And for this, I would assert that quite a bit changed. We saw the breakage numbers come down over the course of uh, the last couple of years with our efforts. And I believe um, Google's numbers showed actually a big drop over the last couple of weeks before the event. Our particular numbers, unfortunately, were just before and just after. We also saw a lot of changes in the industry. Apple made changes both at the OS layer and at the browser layer to help mask some of this user brokenness. Uh, as of OS X Lion, um, all applications now have this benefit that Apple's put in to help ensure that the best protocol that's available is used first. Um, Chrome and Firefox both have this head start for IPv6, but IPv4 as a fallback is ran in parallel just after that. So that if there are problems with IPv4 brokenness, I'm sorry, the IPv6 brokenness, the IPv4 connection will take over. There is one other vendor here that I had hoped would be able to make a change in time. I'm hoping that they'll be able to do something uh, for the next event to help with this issue. The other aspect on whether or not we changed anything is just in terms of the websites that are still dual stack today. 400 plus 
organizations signed up with ISOC to say that they want to participate in World IPv6 Day. Ahead of the event, half of them were already dual stack. For them, it was just another day. During the event, roughly 80 plus percent actually participated total. After the event, many of us did have to turn it back off for business reasons. But from this graph here, quite a few actually did leave it up. And that I would consider to be a success. This even had visibility not just in the government realm, but actually in the political realm itself. We had commentary thinking uh, the from the Department of Commerce, United States, giving ISOC um, applause for the event. And at a conference in uh, London, I had a member of parliament show up to talk about the event as well. And I'm not entirely sure of their technical depth on it versus their staffers, but the fact that IPv6 is being um, buzzworthy to that level of government uh, says a lot. So what's next? Um, we have been talking about World IPv6 whatever as the next event. Um, week has been thrown about, flag day has been thrown about. Uh, many of us are looking at just going dual stack on that event and leaving it up as it is. Um, it needs to be bigger. It definitely needs to be longer. We definitely need access providers. Having content there is all good, but we need eyeballs as well to make it truly successful. We definitely need more global participation. We need, hopefully, well, we I would like to see all parts of the world participate on this. For Yahoo specifically, my goals are to have more of those proxy locations. We had seven before. I'm hoping to have in the 15 to 20 range so that no matter where in the world you are, if you come to us on IPv6, we're serving it close to you. Um, we hope to have more of our sites than just the front page. And we are looking to have all the page assets. So a lot more bandwidth being used over IPv6 versus IPv4. Um, I would like to see at least 50% of the top content that the internet uses served over IPv6. I would like the access providers to see an incentive to invest more on the IPv6 side and have less reason to spend as much money with, with NAT, with CGN, with the address sharing scenario. Um, I, I think it's important for them to have that carrot, that incentive to move forward. Last, I want to thank the Internet Society. They have performed a tremendous amount of evangelism with IPv6 through the years, and in particular for this event. They brought everybody together. They helped get Yahoo, Google, Facebook, and others in a room to hash things out on neutral territory. Um, it's great to be able to work under that umbrella of neutrality to do something so important as IPv6 without the political business barriers being a part of it. And for them just to be excellent hosts. The most important part is they helped give us a date. June 8th, 2011. That gave everybody something to drive for. And that was hugely important in the industry as well as just even within Yahoo Inside. With that, thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Please be seated. Now let's invite Mr. Martin Levy, Director IPv6 Strategy of Hurricane Electric, to share with us the difference before, during, and after World IPv6 Day. Martin, please. I'm going to use this mic. It's... I need to walk around. Um, I'm Martin Levy from Hurricane Electric, and um, talking about before World V6 Day and talking about after World V6 Day really made me think about something 
that I talk to people about, about V6. I've done this um, a few times. I've actually had the opportunity to speak here at this forum, uh, this, in this room, um, uh, quite a while ago. And um, I got to think about this. Because what I would normally want to talk about and what I would want to convince people to take away is that they get to understand what we do with IPv6 at Hurricane Electric. And if we're going to talk about IPv6, then, you know, I've got to be quick because that's a little commercial. What I really would not want to talk about is why we need IPv6. But I'm really kidding. We already have heard that. We are past World V6 Day now. We know there was a need. We know there's been action. So we shouldn't be having to take into account everything that we have been talking about for years. We should be able to accept that. Now, the next thing that I normally talk about, because we are a global network, is, is the world, is the internet ready to move bits around and actually have V6 content be able to uh, be accessed from uh, users. Well, we're after World V6 Day. Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and many hundreds of other entities would not have done World V6 Day if the IPv6 routing tables, the IPv6 global internet, wasn't ready. So already we Talking about that may be a little redundant as well. So what about talking about motivating people and making them interested in, well, in, 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 v, in V6? Well, guess what? That's still important. And finally, I always talk about whether we should be happy because you want to, you want to finish on something interesting. So, so here we go. This is what I would talk about. I would talk about what we've done about our experiences, about how we've uh, run a network for a long time, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would go on and talk about V6. And, and so I'm going to do something rather special and somewhat symbolic for you guys. What, 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 a, what a presenter normally doesn't do, edit the slides in front of people. So here we hit the escape button. And, and, and then we come along here to this and we say, oh, look at all these slides. Well, where's the delete button? I don't need that slide. I don't need that slide anymore. I don't need to tell you about networking. I don't need that slide. I don't need to tell you how we did V6. It's important, but the reality is I don't need to do that in this environment because we're going to be talking specifically about World V6 Day. We know it worked. There was a key phrase that was used. Nothing really happened. It was an easy day. So I'm going to delete the slide that talks about all the steps to do. I'm going to delete the slide about why we need V6. I'm going to delete the slide about address space. Um, we're going to delete the slide about whether V6 exists globally. It's on the Wi-Fi right here. So we know it exists. So we're going to delete the map of the world. We're going to delete the should the press know about this. We know about that. We're going to delete the graphs about the general internet. We don't need to know about that anymore. Um, is V6 supported as a basic connection? I'm going to hit the delete key. Um, so is the, is the V6 routing table ready? Do I ever need to give this talk again? And the answer is no. You know where I'm going with this. So what about deleting um, the tools that you could use? Oh, actually, that would be important. But I'll, I'll give you the URL later. You can play with that yourself. What about graphs? No, no. Oh, there's a nice graph here. We'll keep that one. I'll tell you what that graph is later. What about a review of all those big telcos in the world? No, we don't need that either. So, you know, I, 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 I've got a few more questions and answers. Oh, there's another good graph. It, 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 all the good graphs are going to stay. And then finally we get to a, a slide about World V6 Day. Yeah, we're going to keep that. Um, now, what about our tunnel broker service? This is what gets you going right at the beginning. I, no, we're going to skip that as well. Because quite frankly, uh, quite a few of you have used it. Oh, there's, nice, there's another nice graph. No, I'm going to get rid of that. Oh, but I'm going to talk about certification. Only because of, of what we did earlier. Motivating. But yeah, okay, right. Now, this is how I want to present. I've got far fewer slides now. And quite frankly, we're going to talk about more interesting stuff. 
So, whoops, I've got to go back to the beginning. I don't remember how to use this. Dum -da -dum -da -dum. All right, so, oh, we don't really need that anymore. No, we'll start from the beginning. All right, so, never edit your slides in front of your audience unless you want to make a point. It's 2011. We're done with all the talks about what V6 is. We should be done with all the talks about why we should use it. We're done with all the talks about, this is an experiment we did. And now they're important, but we just went through a very big experiment. Not a Hurricane Electric, but at those content plays, at, at Google, at Yahoo, at Facebook, and hundreds of others. So we, we know this works now because they're pretty big companies and they had a lot on the line. So we're back to a talk. Hi, I'm Martin Levy, I'm from Hurricane Electric, and I'm going to give you a more interesting talk about V6 that talks about what happened at V6 day, some good graphs, and, and, and really some, some interesting views. So, oh, I didn't edit this one. Don't care, don't care, don't care, don't care. Right, let's look at a graph. I love graphs. I love graphs because any graph that goes up and to the right, any graph that goes up and to the right, and every graph I have in this presentation goes up and to the right, says good things are happening, more things are happening. So let's look at these first two graphs. My point of view is different than what you heard from Google and Facebook. Both of those companies, sorry, Google and Yahoo, I'm sorry, Google and Yahoo, both of those companies do run very large networks around the world and very large data centers, but they provide content. Our company moves that content around for people. That's what internet backbones do. So internet backbones are where we measure V6 for us, where we measure V6 readiness, where we measure more V6 happening. So these two graphs are great. It says for the last eight months that there has been 66%, a 66% increase in the number of IPv6 networks, addresses that have shown up on the global internet. That percentage is phenomenally high for a protocol that's been around for 10 or 11 years that has sat at amazingly small numbers for a long time until about three, four years ago. But to see 66% within two thirds of a year, is fantastic. The second graph looks at um, the number of individual networks, the organizations that run networks, that interconnect, and whether they have enabled V6. That means a conscious decision by a network engineer to change their operating network from one that has been V4, maybe for many, many years, to a network that runs V4 and V6 and participate globally, interconnect globally. So it's a great thing to see these, both these graphs going up. Now the second one, by the way, looks like it's a little flat at the top. I'll give you a clue. This isn't in Asia. This is a, a phenomenon in, in Europe. They go on vacation in July and August and you can't get anything done. I'd like to take the type of European vacations that, that these guys do, but it, it doesn't happen. So, so things sort of slow down for a couple of months. Okay. So let's take a much longer view, because again, this graph is again up and to the right. It's even better. Now we go back three, four years and say, what has been happening? What type of networks have turned on? And what we see here is a graph that uh, three, three years ago was, uh, you know, 3.6% of global networks, not users, by the way. Remember, I don't count users. I count networks. And those numbers grew and grew and grew, but something magical happened in January of this year. Actually, the, really, the, the first few days of, of, of February. IANA ran out of IPv4 addresses, and it generated a massive jump in the amount of press and the amount of realization by network operators that v4 was running out. And the graph changes. People say, oh, better do this v6 thing. Now, about parallel to that, ISOC and the uh, content providers we talked about earlier announced World V6 Day, and people got interested in V6. So they 
One side, they got interested just by the content. The other side, they got interested because of the running out of V4. And the graph changed. It, it started jumping up a little bit. World V6 Day happened. And then part of Europe went on vacation again. The graph drops down. So we'll see what happens in, in about now. And they, they will get back about, well, it's a Friday. They'll get back on Monday or Tuesday. Actually, Monday is a, a bank holiday in, 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 in um, no, no, the, last week was a bank holiday in, in England. And then um, uh, uh, America's got, a, bank hol uh, got a, a holiday on Monday. So we'll see what happens in a couple of days after that. So now let's go down to the meat. This is what we really want to talk about. What happened on World V6 Day? Let's see whether at my level, at the backbone level, we see something good happening. Now, you know full well it's going to be good because that's what I want to talk about. So I'm going to give you some graphs. So this is the traffic graph. It's a different kind of graph than you saw. Now, part of it may look the same. It goes up, lots of stuff happens, and then it sort of goes down a bit. But let me explain what this is. This is a graph of bandwidth consumed by end users running IPv6 that suddenly got access to IPv6 content. The quad A's were turned on by the content providers. And things changed. And things changed for us dramatically and instantaneously. At 5 in the afternoon in California, because that's when zero UTC um, uh, kicked in, that would have been, what, 8 o'clock, I think, in the morning here in, in Hong Kong. But at 5 in the afternoon, the traffic levels went up. Now, normally, if you're in network planning, you suddenly go, oh, you're going to make that much of a change which ultimately over the day actually peaked at about 5x the traffic, five times as much traffic. So you would turn around and say, oh, had I tested that? Have I planned for that? Well, let me explain something about, about V6 traffic at the IP backbone. We actually have an easier job than the content players. And we actually have an easier job than people who are deploying uh, CP, customer premise equipment, little routers into the home. Why? Because we're running big, fat boxes with big, fat pipes around the globe, moving traffic, not per individual, but per millions of individuals. And the type of hardware that we use, big routers, they sit in data centers, and they sit in co-location and telco facilities around the world. At this point in their, in, in, in their evolution, they're agnostic to V6 or V4. Every packet that's moved around, that's touched by a piece of silicon at 10 gigabits per second on an interface or even more at a backplane level, is simply agnostic to this protocol. Five years ago, couldn't have said that. Ten years ago, absolutely had no way to say that. But you look at the modern hardware that is shipped by the many different players that build uh, network routers, network switches and the like, and you realize that they are, t they are treating IPv6 and IPv4 equally. Because of that, it didn't affect us. It's just more bits. We like more bits. By the way, why do we like more bits? Because we charge a little bit more if you use a little bit more bandwidth. That, that's a subtlety of the business, but that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that at the backbone level, V6 or V4, we don't care. As a company, we like to see more V6, so we love this graph. So for 24 hours, things just went like perfect, and we didn't have anything to do. We've been running V6 on our backbone um, for years and years and years and years. We've been ready. We, don't, we have our own content, but we've been shipping our own content, but we're not a big content play. We run large data centers in California. We have customers using it. We had a few customers panic prior to this. We'll talk about that in a bit. But in reality, this is good. Let's look at a long-term view, and I can talk about what more, a little bit more about this. So now let's take the graph, and we'll look at it after um, about a week or so. And you realize that the traffic levels for us stayed high. And they stayed high because people realized and people decided to leave their quad A's, to leave their V6 content live. Now, in reality, a majority of this is video from YouTube. 
There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. That is a, 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 a very simple fact. When you look at the size of data that is moved around that's just text, small. Static images, bigger. Maps with lots of images on them, much bigger. Video, enormous. This jump makes perfect sense. It's very well understood. But the reality is that the numbers settled at about three times the bandwidth level. Not bad. This was a good day. This got more people aware about V6. It got more V6 traffic on the global internet. And we turned around and said, well, V6 day was fine. We didn't have anything to do. This was good. So a couple of interesting things about this that, um, um, that, that come out of this. People come and ask us, well, what percentage of traffic is V6 versus V4? And we still turn around and say, it's unfortunately quite insignificant. Because there is so much traffic on the global internet. What we're talking about here is still a very small percentage. But it's there, and it works. And exactly the point that was made in, 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 the, in the previous talks, that the V6 content, the V6 movement of traffic has to be on par, has to be just as reliable as moving V4 because you don't want it to be a bad ex experience. And quite frankly, that's where we're at. So, so, so again, quite a good graph here. Let's look at another one. So this is a subtlety. So we measure a few different things. This graph is sort of the same graph, but we're coloring it in a little differently. And what we're coloring in here and we're saying, oh, but there's still some transition technology that exists out there. In fact, there's quite a bit of it, quite a surprise. Some of those users running V6, or we think they're running V6, are actually running transition um, protocols like 6 to 4 or Teredo. That means they don't know they're running V6. They're configured to run V6 on their, uh, uh, on, on their, on their laptops, on their desktops, or on their, little, on their uh, routers, wireless routers, but they don't know anything about this. And in fact, their V6 is being delivered by a gateway, um, a relay that exists somewhere in the world. For us, we run a, a whole bunch of them uh, spread around the world, including here in, in, um, in Hong Kong. And we know that although this is not the best protocol, and in fact you can prove that it's, it, 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 is, it is actually got quite a, some interesting failure modes. If it really failed completely, there would be no orange on this map, on this graph. It would just simply not exist. But the fact that it existed to that percentage shows it's working. And so we know there are users, it's not perfect, but at least for the people that are sitting in this transition space, they're at least being delivered a service. So let's look at a few other measurements and a few other graphs. This one's a little different. This is a measure of the Alexa 1 million website list. It's a list that's produced on a regular basis of the top million websites in the world. Now, in fact, it turns out million's a pretty large number. The top 10 list is more interesting, and it, and it includes the type of players you expect to see inside um, uh, the World V6 Day uh, content player list. It, it, you expect to see the Googles, the Facebooks, the Yahoos, etc. Um, you see others as well that are well known. But when you get to a million, you basically get this phenomenally large list of websites, ones you've never heard of, ones that you never probably would even go visit. But they're there. And so this gives us a nice measure. It gives us a great list to go out and measure. And we measure this every day. We have done for probably six or seven years now. And we say, how many of those domains are running V6? And the numbers have always been very small. And on World V6 day, boom, up they went. And they went back down the next day. So what we, 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 we can measure from this is that there were hosting players that, 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 that got involved in World V6 day for domains that we've never heard of, uh, maybe domains that never got accessed on that day, except for maybe our testing, I don't know. But the reality is that there is an interest even at the smaller level. And they tried it for a day, they turned it off. You can tell that some left it on. We'd like that, that to go up. It's still a very small percentage, but it's a good measure. Let's look at Tunnel Broker. 
Tunnel Broker is our technology. Um, there are various tunnel brokers in the world. We run probably the largest deployed tunnel broker. Um, and it's been used by software developers. It's been used by, by universities. It's been used by companies. It's used by lots of individuals, obviously. And so we saw on that day, these graphs are uh, in California time, so they're actually skewed. So you have to look at these this two day, but you see this wonderful bell shape of up interest, and then the interest goes away. The press engine obviously worked. So if we look at World V6 Day, we see that there is great success at getting the message out and getting people who say, oh, "What is this V6 thing? Let me do a search. Let me find out what it is." Oh. How do I get connected? Oh, there's a tunnel broker. I don't know the graphs for other people that offer this service, but there were people out there that wanted to try and connect their computers to V6 and see what this V6 thing was. Now, the great thing about V6 today is that, in fact, what you end up with is a website that looks identical to V4. Uh, that's by design, of course. But it's great to see this. So this is large numbers. This is, this is a good indication of interest. I'll show you one other graph. This is a graph from three and a half years ago. This was the IETF announcement by Google, by, by Eric and by Lorenzo. Um, I think actually Eric and Lorenzo personally, right? Lorenzo was there, I was with the launch meeting. Oh, okay. Of the IPv6.google, which was just a, uh, it got a lot of press, got a lot of interest. And we got numbers here where we went from 20 or 30 people a day being interested to 50 or 60 people a day interested. The scale over those years is radically different. So as a comparison, that's pretty cool. Okay. So do we have problems? Remember, we're a backbone. We have customers. We have customers um, who use us and, and, and they want to, to use V6. So do we have issues? Yes. We had classic technical issues that were well understood and have been known, but we have an education issue of teaching other people. We talked about um, the, the, the technical details of whether ICMP v6, uh, IPv6 uh, ICMP messages are filtered or not. Something that in v4 hasn't made much difference, but makes a big difference in the way v6 works. We saw failures. We saw big companies um, who had done months and months of testing, but still hadn't tried this uh, couple of issues that caused them problems. So we saw things that needed to be fixed. Um, we saw people do testing. Uh, there were a couple of companies that did one-hour testing. So we saw little spikes in the graph, and we, we, we knew that they could uh, use those to, to flush out problems like this. We found people using Teredo for the first time, thinking, oh, well, let's give it a try. And Teredo is unbelievably easy to break, and therefore they were worried that their website would be broken uh, by those users. Um, again, if you really sum this all up, it was really a great education of how to use v6 so we sat through people and, and talked to them about this now I'm taking a side to side here the question is this got asked of a few people you know so what were you doing on world v6 day were you sitting in the lab or the knock or the um, uh, in, I mean with the engineering team with, uh, with, with 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 sodas and pizza hunkered down for 24 hours in case something went wrong, making sure that it could be addressed, having that red button to press in case you had to turn it all off very quickly, which really some people talked about. Well, I told you that V6 has been, we've been doing V6 for a long time. So the question is, what, you know, what was I going to do on that day? I'd been, I'd been talking about V6 for so long. I was so happy about this day. We knew the traffic was going to jump. I, had a, I, I took a vacation day. Why? Because my daughter was graduating from high school, and you have to have priorities in life. I'm very proud of my daughter. I'm unbelievably proud of my daughter. Um, she graduated as, uh, uh, as the president of the senior uh, class, and I spent the day sitting in the sun, watching, well, in the afternoon, watching my daughter graduate. The reality is that if you do this right, it's a non-event, and that's a good thing. All right, so I'm going to talk about the certification program because I'm going to talk about motivating people and talking about just, uh, you know, just, just, just some of the one item that we have been doing for a few years. We've been doing various things for various numbers of years, but the things you use, a few years, you heard about the certification program. Um, 
uh, now available in Chinese, but what we're now, I'm just going to give you an idea of what it is if you haven't heard about it. It's a set of online testing. I claim it isn't complicated. I'm a little biased on that. But it is a set of online testing that not only asks the simple questions of how do you use IPv6, but it also then goes and tests whether you can do things with IPv6. Can you configure a web server to deliver web pages on v6? Email. Can you do pings and trace routes on v6? It's very practical. It's great for an administrator or a network operator. And I've actually had companies, um, uh, managers of companies said, well, can I just tell all my network engineers to do this? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, it goes through many, many stages. And you start right at the beginning, and you end up at the top end of being given a certification of SAGE. Now, what you get, well, we'll talk about that in a bit, but basically you get a GIF image to put maybe on your Facebook page or, or, or your homepage or somewhere. Um, the testing is, is just a set of questions and, and very simple, and it's meant to be that way. We go through a whole set of lists. I mean, here we can go read through this, but let's not do that. We'll, we'll skip this. We'll talk about this. We have a lot of people. We have in the region of over 3,500 um, uh, people who have taken this test right to the top and hit the absolute top level we call SAGE from around the world, um, in Asia, in North America, in Europe, um, in um, uh, not so many in Africa. We'll, we'll work on that one. But the point is, it's just people who have just been interested in this and taken the time and have done this. And it's been a great program, which is why we've gone and done this expansion uh, now into uh, Chinese because it really does make a difference. Being able to, to, take, um, um, to take this and open it up to a much larger audience um, has been key. And working with ISOC Hong Kong, as I said earlier, um, which is an absolute pleasure, but uh, we realize that, 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 that this is the, the right next step to do. OK, last part. How do you motivate people to, to, to think more about V6? And the answer is a t-shirt. Yeah, I give you many different answers to this, but, but, but our experience is a t-shirt. So we've shipped out thousands of t-shirts. When you hit that top level, you hit Sage, and you give us the correct postal address. It's a slight problem there, let me tell you that. The number, we get quite a few interesting little you know, packaged t-shirts that come back from around the world with very strange addresses. But we announced this way back, um, you know, in, in May of 2010. And we've been doing this for about a year. And then we finally came around and said, if you hit our top level, we'll send you a t-shirt. It's got a really cool, nice, very geeky uh, design on it. Um, and boom, that day, biggest number of tests ever taken. You know your audience. Rule number one, know your audience. So the reality was that shipping a t-shirt is the right way to get more V6 in the world. Um, now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take an aside, actually, because I'm going to tell you a little bit about why this SAGE testing and why this testing was, was and why we're actually interested in, in expanding this from, a, 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 from a, a language point of view. There is a subtle, subtle test inside getting that SAGE level. I told you that the part of the testing is things like get your website to be V6 enabled. Send an email over V6. Receive an email over V6. Do a ping, do a trace route. This is good stuff, let me tell you. This is system administrators and network administrators live for this stuff. But to get that last level, you have to get your DNS right. And you have to get your DNS enabled for V6. Just not your DNS server. That, that was easy. That's an easy test. Not just the contents of your DNS server. Also easy. But you have to go to whatever entity you have registered your domain at and say to them through their registrar, whoever you pay, I don't know how much you pay in Hong Kong, but let's say you pay a few dollars a year, and say, I want to make sure that there's an IPv6 address in your database pointing back to my DNS server. So that in the day that the world is 100% v6, there'll be no problem getting to the, to, to, to the website, to the domain, to send email, to do anything like that. Well, 
we've enlisted now so far 3,600 people to send an email, go to the support page, pick up the phone, do whatever they can to a whole set of domain registrars from the people running .com to the people running .hk to the people running every domain around the world and say, um, I'd like to update my name server and, and I have a, a quad A record, a V6 address. And a large number of responses have been, oh, we don't support that yet. No one's really asked for it. Well, it's fundamental to making V6 work globally. And so over the year and a bit that we've done the SAGE testing, more and more of these registrars keep hearing from people they've never heard from before asking for V6. The goal was to motivate people to do this mass sort of crowd effect of phoning people around the world, the dot CX in Christmas Island, which is actually run by a bunch of people in New Zealand, um, the dot com guys, whether it be the big guys at VeriSign or other play people, uh, the registrars here in Hong Kong as much as in Japan, as much as anywhere else. And slowly but surely, more and more of these registrars have realized this V6 thing is important because they keep having users asking for it. They want their T-shirt. It has been very useful to go through this process. It has been, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. One extremely large registrar in the, in the US um, basically turned around and said, no, nah, we don't have any support for that. It's not available on the website. Can't do it. I need to do it, says the user. This goes on. And finally, the registrar, big registrar, says, OK, here's the IP address of the da database administrator guy. Um, he can do it by hand for you. So we published that, that email address. And a lot of people contacted him. And then the code got updated, and they became v6 enabled. It's a great way of doing things. So that was part of what we did. You know, T-shirts uh, are great motivators. OK, final thought. Final thought, I'm done. I told you about graphs and the type of graphs I like. This is the graph I like. It's a very simple graph, but it's absolutely true. Over time, slowly but surely, with, I know, a lot of effort on the part of people who have stood giving presentations with a mic, the amount of V6 that's out there, the amount that is available, the amount of content, the amount of connectivity, the amount of good routing, the amount of DNS, the amount of eyeballs has increased. And it continues to increase. And it isn't so important to know about that percentage, but it's more important to know that graph. It is up and to the right. Anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Please be seated.